English humour. A limelight shone onto the stage of English language humour. Part 4 The birth and adolescence of stand-up When we talk about humour and comedy today, one of the first things that might come into our minds is the figure of the stand-up comedian. Now a set feature of the comedy landscape, but in fact quite a latecomer. In the English language, I've been dating it to the rise of the music hall comedians. But the USA has a parallel but very different history. We have to go back to the 1800s and the minstrel shows, often done by the blackface performers I mentioned earlier. These would have had their root in the medicine shows that toured the country and invariably included a humorous monologue known as the stump monologue and I imagine the original stump would be a tree stump but something similar was used as part of the act with clowning around falling off it the point being that the blackface performer was mimicking the now free black people their way of speech peppered with malapropisms a malapropism is a badly used word in comedy at least intentionally dating back to the figure of Mrs. Malapop in Sheridan's comedy The Rivals. Where did politics start? It started way back yonder in the time when George Washington Machine crossed the Delaware. And when he got on the other side of the Delaware, who did he see standing over there? Napoleon with his bones apart. And what did they do? They sit right there on the banks of the Delaware and they sign the Declapendence of Indigestion. <laughs> now then, my friends, <clears throat> we are here to get the votes and I want the ladies' vote. And here they might follow a song or a dance routine. Curiously, there were others which sent up science or philosophy lectures that were popular in the day. The targets here were women's rights, black congressmen and the topics of the day. It should be said that these minstrelsies, as they were also called, were performed sometimes by all black troops and all black bands were very popular. However, freed slave Frederick Douglass had another opinion. He described blackface performers as the filthy scum of white society who have stolen from us a complexion denied them by nature in which to make money and pander to the corrupt taste of their white fellow citizens. Nowadays we would say he has a point, but back then people would make a living out of this. Thomas Dartmouth Rice was one of the most successful blackface performers. Thomas Rice's most successful song and dance number was a routine called Jump Jim Crow, based on the character of Jim Crow that he'd invented. Now, of course, we've heard of Jim Crow before. He later gave his name to the segregation laws. But the Boston Post of the time wrote, The two most popular characters in the world at the present are Queen Victoria and Jim Crow. William Whitlock of the Virginia Minstrels was the other big cheese in blackface, and when I listened to his routines with the thick accent and the constant malapropisms, it reminded me of nothing so much as the Lancashire dialect poetry that my mother used to recite. I was pondering Mark's problem with Tabby. Fair-minded. When Rita out at blue, a strict feline diet's the answer, and cut daily meals down to two. So all that's happening in America, and they needed stages. Uh, some theatres were built to accommodate these uh, travelling shows, and they became known as vaudeville. Nobody knows quite why. And these quickly separated into small time, medium time, or big time. And if you hit the big time, you'd be in New York. And there we kind of join forces because these popular vaudeville, sometimes burlesque acts were very similar to the London Music Hall. Of course, the live British performers had a slight advantage over the Americans as Costa and Biles Music Hall put on the first ever public projection of a movie, as the Americans say, in 1896. Now, what became Hollywood? very quickly began to be able to pay more money 
than the touring shows. With the advantage also that there was none of that damn touring. And the big books certainly lured away many of the first famous screen performers such as Al Jolson, W.C. Fields, Mae West, Buster Keaton and the Marx Brothers. Meanwhile, the other vaudeville stars filmed their acts so they could get a nice one-time payoff from the cinema. But this, of course, inadvertently helped to speed up the death of vaudeville. Because, as has been mentioned before, once the routine's been seen, it's been seen. Remaining survivors of the time might have scuttled off after the cat's kills for a few more paydays. In the turn of the century London, meanwhile, Little Titch became the first ever comedic headliner. Not much is known of what his routine consisted of, but we can see film of him tumbling and dancing in oversized shoes. Max Miller, the next big star, was also a pioneer. He would stand at the front of the stage often, with one foot on the footlights, looking around at everyone in the audience so they all feel included. How do we know this? Well, because there's film of him doing it. But there's no film of Sid Field, apart from two very bad ones. He was the next big name, and then came Ted Ray, credited with being the first comedian to dress normally. Max Miller would often appear with huge floral jackets. Baggy check trousers were quite a uniform. But no, there was Ted, the normal man, talking about normal things. And starting the whole idea of the comedian as one of us. Max, as we've seen, would make the audience laugh with innuendo, sometimes very crude. When roses are red, they are ready for plucking. When a girl is 16, she's ready for, here, now, I know what you're thinking. That kind of thing. Then blaming the audience for being rude. A direct descendant of this was Sir Frankie Howard, another master of the double entendre. But also quite similar to Max Miller in his delivery style. His, ooh, I say, well, would you believe it? So a Frankie Howard script might look something like, well, I was going to the circus the other day. Yes, no, well, yes. Oh, I'm getting too old for this. No, listen, yes. A fellow comedian was quite taken aback one day when he discovered one of Frankie's scripts and saw that all the asides were written down. Another possible difference between us Brits and the Americans is that during the 30s, 40s and 50s, the nightclub circuit was owned and operated by the Mafia almost exclusively. If not, there were small folk clubs like San Francisco's Hungry Eye or what was called the Lecture Circuit, where comedians like Woody Allen would go gigging. Playboy clubs were set up to host various kinds of entertainment, but a lot of comedy. And there was a circuit known as the Chitlin Circuit, which was exclusively for black comedians. Well, frankly, I don't know how they got on, but as I've mentioned before, a lot of these music halls were in fact drinking establishments with a show. And the live performers back then, and to some extent now, would have to know how to put up with hecklers. Now, a heckle is a put-down. It in fact means to comb wool. And this was the profession of some very tough people from Aberdeen, apparently, that were got the reputation of being the worst audiences. This kind of trickled down to the much-feared Glasgow Empire, of which it was said, if you could play there, you could play anywhere. Well, the idea of the heckler is, was part of the thing in the day. They're never very welcome, to be honest. But the good comedian had to be ready for the hecklers and armed with the antidote, which was known as a put-down. The typical comedian, let's take London's Tommy Trinder as an example, would have a, a stock of ready phrases. Nice shirt, sir. Didn't the wife notice the hole in the curtains? This is what happens when cousins marry. They pay me for being stupid. What's your excuse? And in more modern times, I've heard, well, if I've said something that's offended you, I'm glad. Or, a night out for you, a night off for your carer. 
As the known master of the put-down, Mr Trinder was asked in a, an interview towards the end of his life if he'd ever been bested by a heckler. Oh yes, he said. One day, some chap was wandering down the centre aisle as he'd come in late, and he did the usual, Good evening, sir. Have you come on a bicycle? Or something. Halfway down the passage, he stopped. He looked up at me, and he said, Bloody hell, if I'd known you were on, I'd have stayed at home. And so, gradually, the comedian became the star. The great Tommy Cooper from Wales, whose shtick was the comedian that couldn't really do magic, although of course he could, was one of the last great music hall style performers. <laughs> Doctor, I said, I have broke my arm in several places. He said, well, you shouldn't go to this place. <laughs> What? Yes. Very nice, sir. A man who just couldn't stop being funny. Once, after a performance for the Queen, he was in a lineup ready to meet her. On being introduced, he was to say, Honoured to meet you, ma'am. And then he could say nothing unless he was asked a question. And so this transpired. But as the Queen was about to move off, Tommy Cooper said, Excuse me, ma'am. And everybody thought, Oh dear, what's he going to say? And what he said was, Do you like football? The Queen said, No, I don't like football, Mr Cooper. And he replied, Oh, in that case, can I have your tickets for the cup final? Tommy Cooper, Les Dawson, Frankie Howard, Benny Hill. Benny Hill was thrown off the TV due to political correctness, it was rumoured. Though some say it was just doing the same gag over and over again. Benny Hill and Frankie Howard had a great mutual respect and they died on the same weekend. Benny Hill was sitting watching television when he passed away and remained there for two days before he was discovered. Frankie Howard passed away on the same weekend. The newspapers wanted a comment from Benny Hill, and after they tried to get in touch with him several times, decided to make one up. And that was how Benny Hill gave Frankie Howard an obituary when he was dead. Now in tandem to all this, in the 70s, although they seem to have been around for a long, long time before that, we got the phenomenon of the Working Men's Club, and this was a breeding ground for another kind of comic. The television programme for comedians gave a nice little window onto this world. And what we saw was a slightly behind the times world of mother-in-law jokes and racial stereotypes. Although I'll be talking about this particular strand in another segment. For now, let's just be aware that it was going on and getting onto the TV. And as a reaction to this, and I'll leave this strand here as well, you got in the 80s what was called the alternative comedy scene. The Comedy Store in London opened up, advertising for comedians. 115 people filled in their forms, tried out, and that's how the Comedy Store started. Now this idea had been imported from New York and Chicago, but these again will feature further on in the story when we get to talk about improvised comedy. For now, we'll leave all the ingredients stirring in the melting pot as we take a trip back in time now because we've rather left our first strand abandoned. Let's go and look at how we can play with words. Because puns aren't the only way we can have fun with language. Mm -hmm. 